Various molecules pass through the cell membrane by means of various mechanisms known as transport across cell membrane mechanisms and these mechanisms are classified into different types. So these types include passive transport mechanisms and active transport mechanisms. Now these classification is based fundamentally on whether energy that is biological energy ATP is being required for this or not. So passive transport processes do not require ATP while active transport uh, processes require ATP and why is that? Because all passive transport processes occur from their higher concentration to the lower concentration. So if suppose sodium is being transported it will from the higher concentration of sodium to the lower concentration of sodium. On the other hand, active is against the concentration gradient that is uphill transport. So in passive, we have a simple diffusion, facilitated diffusion, then there is non-ionic diffusion, then there is osmosis and there is another one known as ultrafiltration. And in active transport, we have primary active transport and secondary active transport. Secondary active transport again further has uh, two mechanisms that is symport and antiport. So, let us quickly see what are the characteristics of uh, these types of transport mechanisms and then we will short, uh, solve some MCQs. So, in simple diffusion, what are the requirements for simple diffusion to occur? First of all, that uh, simple diffusion, remember the word simple when we are saying, then it is across the lipid bilayer. It happens across the lipid bilayer. See, cell membrane has both lipids and proteins. But when the molecule moves through the lipid bilayer, then it is known as simple diffusion. Okay. And uh, for this, what will be the requirement? That the substance which is moving should be lipid soluble. More the substance is lipid soluble, more will be the rate of simple diffusion. So that is simple diffusion. And which direction will it be? It will be from its higher concentration to lower concentration. Example, what are the substances uh, which can move like that? There is uh, oxygen, carbon dioxide, nitrogen, basically all the gases. They move by simple diffusion. Then any other lipid soluble substances like uh, there are steroids, okay, then alcohol, they move by simple diffusion. Then what are the factors which affect the rate of simple diffusion? Well, this is given by a law known as Fick's law. What is that? Fick's law state that the rate of diffusion rate is uh, equal to that is uh, the it depends on three main things that is the characteristics of the membrane then the partial pressure or concentration gradient and the characteristics of the substance which is being transported. So it also depends on the solubility of the substance in the membrane that is the lipid solubility and molecular weight of the substance. So let us write the formula. Rate will be directly proportional to the area of the membrane that is more the area more will be the rate of the transport inversely proportional to the thickness of the membrane. So these are the properties of the membrane. Then it is directly proportional to Delta C that is the concentration gradient or when we are talking about gases this will be written as delta P right and then there is something known as diffusion coefficient diffusion coefficient which is basically the solubility of the substance and on denominator there will be square root of molecular weight. So more the thickness of the membrane or larger the substance more the molecular weight of the substance the rate of simple diffusion will be less. But one thing you note here that it, this rate is directly proportional to the concentration gradient. That means if we keep all other things constant, right, the membrane properties are constant and uh, the substance, we talk about a single substance suppose, then what will happen that the rate of diffusion will increase linearly with the concentration gradient. So here is the rate of transport. Rate of transport is increasing linearly as the concentration gradient is increasing and this is known as linear kinetics. Okay. So simple diffusion follows linear kinetics. So uh, with this let us solve one MCQ on simple diffusion quickly. The rate of simple diffusion increases with is it concentration gradient, thickness of membrane, molecular weight of the substance or water solubility of substance. Well, 
we are talking rate of simple diffusion increases it increases with concentration gradient as we have seen that there is a linear kinetics it is following with thickness of the membrane fixed cell of diffusion we saw that rate of simple diffusion is actually inversely proportional to the thickness of the membrane molecular weight of the substance right again it is in denominator it is inversely proportional to square root of the molecular weight of the substance and water solubility of the substance actually here we said that the lipid solubility rate of diffusion is directly proportional to the lipid solubility so this is like opposite of the lipid soluble more the substance is lipid soluble that means less it is water soluble isn't it so uh, if water solubility is more that means uh, lipid solubility is less right and uh, less lipid solubility means the rate of diffusion will be less fine now let's move on to next one that is the facilitated diffusion what are the requirements of facilitated diffusion first of all just note here that it is diffusion okay diffusion means that the transport of molecules will always be from higher concentration to lower concentration and again it does not require atp because of this the downhill transport of substances is occurring does not require atp however there are certain proteins which are facilitating this transport that means the substances which are not lipid soluble okay they can move from their higher concentration to a lower concentration by facilitated diffusion and this is facilitated by means of transport proteins there are transport proteins so proteins are required and these transport proteins can be of two types that is carrier and there can be channels okay so remember passive process no atp required and it requires facilitation by means of the transport proteins that is carrier and channels and what kind of substances will be transported by means of facilitated diffusion obviously as i said that the substances should not be lipid soluble so there can be ions there can be larger molecules larger substances okay larger substances polar substances that uh, need to be transported by facilitated diffusion another example is a uh, glucose transporter glut glut is there glue is for glucose t for transporter so that is glucose transporter that is causing facilitated diffusion then what are the characteristics of facilitated diffusion well remember that this is, is using the transport proteins and uh, whenever a substance is using the transport proteins there are certain characteristics which are being followed because these transport proteins are also required for active transport so what i am going to discuss right now the characteristics will be same for facilitated diffusion as well as for active transport so first of all that it follows saturation kinetics in simple diffusion we saw it was linear kinetics here it is saturation kinetics okay what is that that as the concentration gradient increases okay so as it is increases the rate of transport rate of transport increases first but then it becomes plateau so it is not that uh, if a concentration gradient keeps on increasing continuously rate of transport will also increase linearly no it increases for some time then it plateaus because what happens the transport proteins are limited in number okay they become saturated so actually this name for this is saturation kinetics and this is the maximum rate of transport that is tm maximum rate of transport so that is saturation kinetics then second characteristic is that it is specific the carrier or channels they are specific for a particular substance other substances cannot be transported via uh, these particular transport proteins third because they bind to certain substances so that is why there can be inhibition of these transport proteins so these transport proteins can be inhibited okay by competitive inhibition or non competitive inhibition okay so those were the characteristics of facilitated diffusion and uh, what are the examples as i already told you one example is glut for glucose transport fine so quickly let us see one uh, mcq on this true about facilitated diffusion which of these is true about facilitated diffusion it requires energy uh, 
it requires carrier protein rate of transport is proportional to concentration gradient and it is non-specific well as i told you that uh, c option will be wrong because it follows saturation kinetics so it is not that it is permanently proportional to concentration gradient it rises first and then it plateaus then it is non-specific obviously this is also wrong because wherever transport proteins are there then the transport becomes specific it requires energy is also wrong because uh, it is a passive transport it requires carrier protein is the correct answer fine let's move to the third type of transport mechanism that is osmosis uh, we said that the third type of um, transport mechanism non-ionic diffusion well this kind of transport mechanism happens for certain substances which are basically in lipid soluble form and they can diffuse when in lipid soluble form but they cannot diffuse when they are in ionic form one example of it is uh, the transport of ammonia in kidneys so when there is ammonia it can cross through various parts of the nephron right and uh, in the interstitium also there is ammonia so concentration of ammonia is uh, present everywhere but once it enters the collecting ducts so this ammonia binds with the hydrogen ions which are being secreted okay and then it forms the ammonium ion so this ammonium ion now cannot cross the membrane and hence this ammonium ion is then excreted out so this is an example of non ionic diffusion fine moving on to osmosis what is osmosis osmosis is movement of water molecules from low concentration of solute to high concentration of solute so if i mark here a and b right here you see there is no uh, concentration of solute in b but in a the solute is present so water will move from b to a right and uh, what will happen that uh, this level because of the water movement will start rising right so that is known as osmosis the movement of water and a very important requirement for osmosis is that the membrane should be permeable only to water it should not be permeable to solute see if it is permeable to solute then the solute will also cross and what will happen that the solute concentration on both sides will become equal so there will be no water movement understanding or not so for osmosis to occur we want that the membrane should be permeable only to the water or what is known as the presence of effective osmol so the the solute which is present in this case a if it is not able to cross the membrane then it is known as effective osmols because then the water can move and what is ineffective osmols ineffective osmol is the molecules which can cross the membrane one example being urea urea so if there is a solution in a with urea what will happen that urea will cross on the other side i am talking about in body also that happens that urea glucose they can cross the membrane okay so these are known as ineffective osmols and uh, what is osmotic pressure osmotic pressure is the pressure required to prevent the osmosis so i have to put pressure on a right on the a side so that the osmosis can stop and now you can understand that if the concentration of the solutes in a is more then the water will be drawn much more towards a and then the osmotic pressure required to stop osmosis will be more okay so that is osmotic pressure the pressure required to stop os uh, osmosis and it is more when the solute concentration is higher more details about uh, this uh, osmosis and osmotic pressure we'll see in another video on uh, uh, where we will discuss the concept on moles equivalence etc fine let's move on to active transport well active transport as i said before is of two types primary active transport and secondary active transport first of all the basic characteristics of both the types of active transports are same that is it requires energy atp is required right and the movement of molecules is from low to high concentration gradient low to high concentration gradient that is against their concentration gradient and uh, what is this primary active versus secondary active transport see if this is a cell okay and uh, say 
here is the transport mechanism. A common example of primary active transport is sodium potassium ATPase, which throws out three sodium ions from the cell and brings in two potassium ions inside the cell. And you see the name. What is the name? It is sodium potassium ATPase. So this pump has a ATPase attached to it. So this ATPase will break down ATP directly. So when the energy is utilized directly by the transport protein, it is known as primary active. By the way, this um, utilization of energy directly by the protein, the transport protein, also gives them another name. So these transport proteins are known as pumps. Okay, pumps. So for primary active transport, the proteins are pumps. Then for secondary active transport, what happens that the energy is utilized indirectly. What does that mean? Say suppose the sodium potassium ATPase is there. So th there will be three sodium moving out and two potassium moving in. Fine. And uh, what happens because of this, the sodium ions inside the cell become less. If sodium ions are less, that means uh, you see if on this side, on the other side, if uh, there is high concentration of sodium ions and these sodium ions can move inside okay there is a concentration gradient if the path is open there is a concentration gradient for sodium to move from outside to inside and this is being used by secondary active transport for example there is SGLT sodium glucose transporter so the concentration gradient for sodium is being maintained by sodium potassium ATPase and this causes sodium to bind to this SGLT and causes the movement of sodium from its high concentration to low concentration and of glucose against the concentration gradient that means from its low concentration to intracellularly high concentrations. So the energy which is stored in the gradient of sodium transport is being used by glucose to be transported against its concentration gradient. One substance is uh, transported along concentration gradient, other substance is being transported against concentration gradient. So that is about secondary active transport where the energy is being utilized indirectly by sodium potassium ATPase for maintenance of gradient of sodium. Now in secondary active we said that there are two types, symport and antiport, simple actually. Symport is when both the molecules are being transported in the same direction. So here you can see both sodium and glucose are moving from outside to inside. So that is symport and antiport is when they are moving in opposite direction. Okay, that means sodium will move from outside to inside while the other substance will move from inside to outside. So that is basically calcium. So antiport example is sodium calcium exchanger. And uh, when the substances are moving in opposite direction, right, so there is an exchange of ions taking place. So that is why there is another term for this um, proteins that is exchanger. Okay, so symport example, SGLT, antiport example, sodium calcium exchanger. Let us see certain details about sodium potassium ATPase because it's very common MCQs and very important also. Sodium potassium ATPase is what basically primary active transport okay it's primary active transport so it directly use utilizes energy ATPase it is associated with ATPase let's come to its structure it has two units alpha unit and beta unit alpha subunit and beta subunit and these subunits have binding sites so suppose this is extracellular and this is intracellular okay now alpha subunit should have binding site of sodium inside because sodium is moving from inside to outside right so inside on the alpha subunit we have sodium binding site we have ATP binding site right and then we also have phosphate binding site phosphate binding site okay so ATP is broken down into ADP and phosphate by ATPase and this phosphate also goes and binds to this alpha subunit intracellularly and uh, when this happens there is change in conformation such that the sodium is released outside and potassium is released inside so outside we have the binding site for potassium actually okay so binding site for potassium and also there is another binding site for uabain or uh, 
similar kind of chemicals like digitalis digitalis which is used as a drug so how this digitalis acts is basically it uh, blocks this activity of sodium potassium ATPase. So once it blocks that activity, what will happen that sodium will start accumulating inside the cell. And if sodium start accumulating inside the cell, what we have seen in uh, our uh, secondary active transport like so this is sodium potassium ATPase and here there is sodium calcium exchanger. So if digitalis blocks this, sodium will start accumulating inside the cell and if sodium starts accumulating, this will not work because we want the gradient for the sodium and hence calcium will not be thrown out of the cell. So calcium accumulates inside the cell that is the muscle. Digitalis is uh, used for heart failure, isn't it? So calcium accumulates inside the cardiac muscle cell and with calcium there is increase in force of contraction so that is how digitalis acts by blocking sodium potassium ATPase. Then uh, another MCQ is asked uh, that uh, glycosylation sites so beta unit has glyco 3 glycosylation sites. Now you should also know about certain functions of sodium potassium ATPase. First of all, you see that it is throwing out three sodium ions and bringing in two potassium ions. So there is unequal movement of ions, isn't it? The positive ions which is moving in is less compared to that which are moving out. So it creates small negativity inside, right? So it creates a negativity of four millivolts inside the cell. So it contributes to generation of resting membrane potential. Plus it also maintains the concentration of these ions, right? What happens that if sodium potassium ATP stop, stops working, then you see the amount of sodium which is going to accumulate inside the cell which will be much more, isn't it? Because three sodiums are being thrown out. So much more sodium accumulates inside the cell. So the osmolarity inside the cell increases and if osmolarity inside the cell increases then water will move, start moving inside into the cell and what will happen ultimately the cell will break down so one function of uh, sodium potassium ATPase is contribution to resting membrane potential how much it contributes minus 4 millivolt second is it maintains cell volume also cell volume very important and the third is as I told you that uh, maintenance of the intracellular concentration of these ions so those are very important functions of sodium potassium ATPase and also remember we have seen that if sodium potassium ATPase stops working then how secondary active transport will also suffer right. So let us solve one MCQ on active transport true about calcium transport is calmodulin mediated it is a sim port it is active process and maintains very high intracellular calcium. Well, as we have seen about the sodium calcium exchanger, the calcium transport outside the cell, it is by sodium calcium exchanger, but there are other calcium transport mechanism also. For example, in sarcoplasmic reticulum, there is calcium ATPase. That is also an active process, but that is a primary active process. Because as I am telling, calcium ATPase, the term itself is including the word ATPase. Okay. So what could be the answer of this? Well, calmodulin mediated? No. Calmodulin is a calcium binding protein. It is a sim port. Well, it can be an antiport. If we see certain uh, calcium transporters, it is antiport, not sim port. It is an active process. Yes, definitely it is an active process. This is the correct option. It maintains very high intracellular calcium. Well, this is absolutely wrong. Intracellular calcium concentration is extremely low. So that is the reason that calcium can act as a signaling molecule. So that was all about the concepts on transport across cell membrane. Thanks for watching the video. If you liked it, do press the like button, share the video with others and don't forget to subscribe to the channel Physiology Open. Thank you.